So uh, our next speaker is going to be uh, Jacob Lurie uh, from Harvard. And um, about a few years ago, I was uh, giving a colloquium talk there. And uh, it's very fortunate for mathematics that Jacob was in the audience. Uh, I described in the course of my talk a, a certain conjecture of Andre Vey from the 1950s, which I thought deserved to be much more widely known. Uh, and then the uh, next morning, Jacob came up to me and he says, oh, I thought about that last night, and I think I know how to solve that. And it, was, it turned out in the end, uh, it took some time for the details to work out, but uh, it was a sort of remarkable synthesis of uh, applying ideas from geometry to a problem that came uh, out of number theory. And so it's really ideal example of the topic of what he's going to talk to us about, which is analogy and abstraction in mathematics. Thank you very much. So. Uh, if you ask somebody on the street what mathematics is about, they'll probably tell you that mathematics is about numbers. When I was in school, we learned that there are all different kinds of numbers. There's counting numbers like 1, 2, 3. There are the integers, where you also have negative numbers. There's the rational numbers, or fractions. There's the real numbers, where you include irrational numbers, like pi and the square root of 2. And then when you got really advanced, there were complex numbers, where you also had a square root of negative 1. So each of these number systems is an enlargement of the previous one. And for the most part, the reason to consider these enlargements is that they make your life easier. So uh, one way that you can articulate this is to say that each of these enlargements allows you to solve equations that you couldn't solve before. So if you want to solve x plus 4 equals 3, you need negative numbers. 4x equals 3, you need fractions. x to the fourth equals 3, you need irrational numbers, and so forth. But this comes at a cost, which is with each of these enlargements, the kind of numbers that you're thinking about are, in some sense, more abstract. I know what it means to have three apples, and it's not so clear to me what it means to have a square root of negative three apples. So this is something that has bothered mathematicians, even, throughout history. So for example, you can see that even in our terminology. So some numbers we call real numbers. And the square root of minus 1, that's an imaginary number. So this terminology goes back to Descartes, and it highlights a sort of discomfort that he had with allowing quantities like the square root of negative 1. And even 200 years later, you can find this statement of Gauss. Gauss is someone who certainly knew what complex numbers were. He knew how to work with them. He could prove all kinds of great theorems with them and about them. But there was still something there that bothered him. And, uh, even a little later than that, there's a famous quote attributed to Kronecker, God made the integers, all else is the work of man. So this, in other words, by increasing, considering these more and more abstract number systems, we're somehow getting away from the core activity of mathematics, which is to study concrete things like the integers. So these attitudes have very much shifted through the years, and it's been a gradual shift. But one inflection point that you can point to is the emergence of abstract algebra in the early 20th century. So uh, the notion, more or less, that is in use today of commutative ring was introduced by Emmy Noter in the 1920s. So a commutative ring is a collection of things that you can add, subtract, and multiply. And addition and multiplication are required to satisfy some rules, which are probably familiar to you, like addition should be commutative. And there, here's a list of all the rules that they need to satisfy. Actually, Emmy Noter didn't require that there was a unit for multiplication. Nowadays, we usually do. So this is a definition, the notion of a commutative ring. It's or a synonym for number system. And uh, I've already given you lots of examples. The integers, the rational numbers, the real numbers, the complex numbers, those are all commutative rings. And there are lots more examples. So let me give you one right now. So modular arithmetic. So fix some positive integer n and consider the collection of numbers 0 through n minus 1. So you can make this collection of numbers into a commutative ring. I need to tell you how to add and how to multiply. Well, what you do is just take two numbers that are in that range and add or multiply normally. Well, you'll get an, an integer which might not fall into that range. But if it doesn't, what you do is divide by n and take the remainder. And that remainder will be back in the range of numbers 0 through n minus 1. So this is an important example of a commutative ring. It has a name. It's, called, it's denoted by this uh, symbol here, red z mod n. 
So anytime someone in mathematics introduces something new, particularly if it's an abstraction, you, the legitimate question is to ask, what purpose does this serve? Why should this be one of the things that mathematics is about? So let me give you a couple of arguments. So why should you care about other number systems? Well, let's suppose that you care about the integers. One answer is that by thinking about other number systems, you can learn new things about the integers. So here's a very simple example. Here's an equation which has no integer solutions. So how could you know it has no integer solutions? There's infinitely many possibilities for x, infinitely many possibilities for y. You can't possibly check them all. But you can make a simple observation, which is that the left-hand side of the equation is always an odd number, and the right-hand side of the equation is always an even number. They can never be the same. Another way of phrasing that is you can check that this equation has no solutions in the ring z mod 2 where you don't have to check infinitely many possibilities. You just have to check two values for x and two values for y. So that's a simple example. Let me give you a little bit more sophisticated one. There's a famous theorem of Fermat, not his most famous theorem, but uh, Fermat's two squares theorem, which asserts that every prime number of the form 4n plus 1 can be written as a sum of two squares. Now, there's uh, many different proofs of this, but there's one that is commonly taught in undergraduate number theory courses at universities, and that proof proceeds by studying a particular commutative ring, the, the ring of Gaussian integers, the ring of consisting of numbers of the form x plus i, y, where x and y are integers. And by studying this ring, you can learn new concrete things about the usual integers. So this is one argument. Let me give you a related argument. Sometimes you can, maybe you don't learn something new about familiar things like the integers, but you can look at facts that you already knew in a new way. So let me give you an example of that. I'm going to give you two facts, one of which is a very concrete statement about the integers, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Every positive integer factors uniquely as a product of prime numbers. So this is a concrete fact about integers, and it has a cousin which is a more abstract fact about number systems. So any commutative ring with finitely many elements also has a unique factorization as a product of local rings. So rather than tell you what that statement means exactly, let me just tell you how it plays out in the one example that I've already given you. So if you have some positive integer n, then z mod n is a commutative ring with finitely many elements. And it factors as a product and that factorization reflects the prime factorization of n. So this statement goes by the name of the Chinese remainder theorem. Concretely, it says, for example, that if you want to know the remainder when a number is divided by 6, it suffices to know the remainder when it's divided by 2 and the remainder when it's divided by 3. So let me give you another kind of argument, getting a little bit less conservative. One reason that you might study other number systems is that they're interesting in their own right. We can find new and interesting questions that we would not have thought to ask before. So let me give you an example of that. So a field in mathematics is a commutative ring where not only can you add, subtract, and multiply, you can also divide. And fields with finitely many elements are very well understood. So there's a finite field with n elements if and only if n is a prime power, and in that case, the field is unique. So finite fields are very fundamental objects in many areas of mathematics. You'll see them all over the place in number theory, in algebraic geometry, in discrete mathematics, some parts of theoretical computer science. They're very interesting objects, and we would not have known to be on the lookout for them if we hadn't been open-minded about considering other number systems, things that behaved like the usual numbers, integers, rationals, and so forth, but maybe we're a little bit different. I want to give you one more argument, which really I think is the most convincing one. There are just so many examples. So once you know what to be on the lookout for, these things are everywhere. So I've given you some examples already, familiar number systems like the integers, rational numbers, and so forth. I told you about modular arithmetic and finite fields. If you're a number theorist, well, there's number fields and they're rings of integers. If you study linear algebra, there's matrix rings, if you're willing to put up with non-commutativity. Uh, polynomials form rings. 
coordinate rings in algebraic and analytic geometry, and so on and so forth. I'm going to stop there, not because I've run out of examples. In fact, probably every mathematician in the audience could come up here and add a few more. So why should we care about this notion of commutative ring? Well, this is just a basic pattern that shows up everywhere in mathematics, that you have an addition and a multiplication that satisfy that list of rules that Emmy Notaire wrote down. So examples are just so common that we need to give this notion a name, and it has become part of the common language that all mathematicians have in common. So I just want to highlight a sort of shift that has occurred when we start thinking about commutative rings. So if I give you a commutative ring R, there's all kinds of questions that you might ask. So mathematical questions like, do you have multiplicative inverses? In other words, can you divide? Or is there something like unique factorization in R? Or are there zero divisors in R? And you could go on and on. There's all kinds of questions that mathematicians can ask about a number system. And I want to contrast this with another kind of question, which I would say is, is not really a mathematical question, like ontological questions. Are, are these things really there? What do they really mean? Now, this belongs to a set of questions which, while they might be interesting, they're, they're not uh, <laughs> questions that <laughs> mathematics <laughs> equips us with the tools to say anything about. So I'm telling you this story. Give, I want to give this to you as an example of one th process that plays out again and again in mathematics, that we start life interested in some particular topic, like theory of numbers. And after time passes, well, we're still interested in numbers, but we're also interested in things that behave like numbers or number systems. We're interested in more abstract entities, and we have many good reasons for being interested in them. So I'd like to describe another uh, example of this paradigm in mathematics, one which is much more recent and is in my own field, the field of topology. So topology is the study of shapes. So an example is the sphere. Another familiar example is the, the torus or a donut pictured here. These are both examples of two-dimensional shapes, but we can study, for example, one-dimensional shapes like the circle, and we can study all kinds of higher-dimensional shapes, which I'm not going to try to show you in this slide. So these are some familiar examples of shapes. I want to describe one which is probably going to be unfamiliar. So I'm going to describe an arts and crafts project that you can do at home. So the first thing you're going to need to do is make yourself a Mobius band. So you, you tear off a strip of paper, and you glue one end to the other, introducing a single twist. So there's a picture of one up there. But when, after you do that, don't throw the rest of the paper away, because actually, you're going to need to make yourself another Mobius band, and a third one. And actually, just keep going. You need infinitely many Mobius bands. <laughs> so now, you're not done. So I want you to look at the line that goes along the middle of the first Mobius band. And I want you to sew that on to the second Mobius band around the edge. So I've indicated what to sew onto what with the dotted red lines in this picture. Now, I call this an arts and crafts project that you can do at home. This step, you might have a little trouble doing at home if you live in three-dimensional space. So, the Mobius band is famous for having only one side, which will make this somewhat of an engineering challenge to actually build, but this is a mathematics talk. I'm just giving you the specifications for how to build this shape, and uh, we'll leave the rest to the engineers. <laughs> so after you've performed this operation, we're not done. I want you to do the same thing again. Take the middle of the second Mobius band and sew it on to the edge of the third. And take the middle of the third Mobius band and sew it on to the edge of the fourth, and so on and so forth. So the end result is some kind of shape. It's an object that topology allows us to study. It belongs to the menagerie of objects with which the subject is concerned. So I'd like to show you a picture of this object, but just like it's hard for you to build it at home, it's hard for me to show you a picture of it on a uh, on the screen, so let me just give you a, a very inaccurate picture of it. 
So this construction, the general construction of this type is called a telescope construction. So here's a very impressionistic picture of what you get. <laughs> so in this picture, each segment of the telescope represents one Mobius band. And each one is attached to the next in a way that isn't really accurately reflected in the picture. So like many sciences, topology has a taxonomy of basic examples which get individual names. And this is actually an important enough example that it has one of those special names. So this shape goes by the name of KZ adjoin 1 half comma 1. Now I want to, this shape is actually closely related to a much simpler shape called the circle, which has a name in the same taxonomy that's just called K of Z comma 1. So these two shapes are closely related, and the relationship can be stated informally by saying that the telescope is what you get when you take the circle and allow yourself to divide by 2. So what does that mean? Well, if you take a piece of string and wrap it around the front end of the telescope, so it goes once around, if you were to then slide that down the telescope to the next segment, you would find that it went around twice. And if you were to slide it down once more, you would find that it went around four times. So that's a sense in which the telescope is somehow letting you divide things by two. So why would you want to do this? So let me propose for you a little one-act play. So here's a, a conversation which is fictional, but is maybe not so different from what you might expect to hear if you wandered into a mathematics department at some university during tea time. So Alice asks Bob what he's up to. And Bob says, well, he's thinking about the telescope. And Alice asks, why the telescope? What's the point? And Bob answers, well, he's not really interested in the telescope. He's really interested in the circle. He had some question about the circle that he wanted to answer. But some, something about the question was too hard. So we thought he might simplify his life by asking the same question for the telescope instead. The telescope, you can divide by 2. And just like it might, it's convenient to be able to divide by 2 when working with ordinary numbers, it can be convenient to be able to divide by 2 when thinking about topology. So this general procedure of taking a shape and making a larger one where you can divide by 2 has a name. It's called localization. It's something you can do not only to the circle, but to many other shapes as well, or any other shape for that matter. So it was already hard for me to show you a picture of what happened when you applied this procedure to the circle. I'm not even going to attempt it for a more complicated shape. Let me just mention that it is something that you can do for more complicated shapes. And there's nothing special about the number 2. You can take any shape and allow yourself to divide by 3, or allow yourself to divide by 4, or any other number that you like. So if you allow yourself to divide by all positive integers, well, then you're entering into the realm of what's called rational homotopy theory. And there's a slogan which goes back a long time, which is rational homotopy theory is easy. Well, what this means is that there are lots of questions that you can ask in topology which are very hard to answer. But if you take those questions and ask analogs of them in the setting where you're allowed denominators, where you're allowed to divide by any number you like, then these questions become much easier to answer. So this was made precise in the work of Quillen and Sullivan, who gave two independently gave concrete procedures for taking questions of topology in rational homotopy theory and converting them into purely algebraic questions, which often can be addressed concretely. So the analogy that I want to highlight here is that taking the integers and enlarging them to add fractions, enlarging them to the rational numbers, is analogous to taking topology and messing with it in the way that I just described, passing to rational homotopy theory where you have also allowed denominators. So these are both procedures which in some sense, they take you into some more abstract realm, but they take you into a more abstract realm where the mathematical questions that you meet are easier to answer. And this is, uh, let me give you a, another more elaborate analogy. The integers are to other commutative rings as 
topology is to the study of other homotopy theories or exotic homotopy theories. So just like there's this notion of commutative ring, which is a kind of mathematical structure that is like the integers in certain important respects. There's addition and multiplication that satisfies the familiar rules, but might differ from it in other respects. Well, there are mathematical disciplines where you can study structures which behave like the theory of shapes in some important respects and might differ from it in some other respects. And this is a sort of theme that has developed in the study of topology or algebraic topology over the last 50 years. And once again, whenever someone introduces an abstraction, a legitimate question is, what is the point? Why should we study exotic homotopy theories? And really, all the same answers that I gave you earlier are applicable here as well. So for example, one reason to study exotic homotopy theories is that they give us tools which we can use to answer questions about things that we already care about, answer, to answer existing questions in topology. Another example is that they're interesting in their own right. There are all sorts of interesting questions and phenomena that appear in the theory of exotic, these exotic homotopy theories. And we wouldn't have known about these questions. We wouldn't have thought to ask them unless we uh, introduced the appropriate definitions. But I think the strongest argument is, again, these things, once you know where to look for them, once you know to be looking for them, you see them everywhere. So what are some examples of exotic homotopy theories? Well, there's the theory of topology itself, the study of shapes. That's maybe not an exotic one. I just told you something about rational homotopy theory, where you simplify your life by allowing denominators somehow. There are other simplifications, like the theory of stable homotopy theory. Um, there are other variants of topology. So the list of examples I've given you so far, these are all uh, mathematical disciplines that were introduced in order to have applications to classical to questions of topology. But there's also a whole host of other examples which for which the intentions are different. So for example, homological algebra, the theory of chain complexes and derived categories, this is uh, something which is more algebraic in nature, but it really falls into the realm of these exotic homotopy theories. Um, since Quillen, it's been understood that if you pretty much take any sort of algebraic structure in mathematics at all, commutative rings, groups, the algebras, all sorts of things that mathematicians like to think about, there's an associated homotopy theory if you let yourself think about simplicial algebras of the appropriate type. So these are, last two examples are sort of algebraic in nature. And there are also uh, homotopy theories that involve a mixture of topological and algebraic considerations, uh, like the theory of structured ring spectra, which is, uh, well, a particular interest of mine. And let me stop there, not because I've run out of examples, but again, uh, this list could go on and on. So I just wanted to bring this to you as an example of, well, something that topology is about nowadays, or algebraic topology specifically. Topology began as the study of shapes, and of course, we're still interested in shapes. But we're also now interested more and more in exotic homotopy theories. We're interested in taking tools from, that originated in order to attack topological questions and repurposing them for applications in other areas of mathematics like abstract algebra. Thank you very much. So do we have any questions for Jacob? No? OK, so I'll, I'll ask a question. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned introducing uh, rational homotopy theory to simplify problems. Mm -hmm. But what about the reverse, that if you simplify the question, but you still want to return back to the original question? Well, that's, of course, uh, you don't, you lose information. So, but for example, suppose that you were wondering if some construction was possible. And suppose you were to find out that you couldn't perform that construction even in rational homotopy theory. Then you've, uh, you've just saved yourself some effort. And there are also techniques for 
you know, addressing the question of how you get back to the integral story from the rational story. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Jacob? Okay, let's thank him again. <laughs>